I'm conscious of the fact that poor communication can lead to all kinds of misunderstandings. So I searched through my books and I came up with an illustration which I know Dennis will really appreciate. He told me he was going to be here this morning, so I picked this one especially for him. <laughs> it's, it's a story about a rather old-fashioned lady who was planning a couple of weeks' vacation. She was also quite delicate and elegant with their language, so she wrote a letter to a campground and asked for a reservation. She wanted to make sure that the campground was fully equipped, though, but she didn't quite know how to ask about the toilet facilities. You know, when you're delicate, it's you know, hard to sort of ask those sensitive questions. She just couldn't bring herself to write that word, toilet. After much deliberation, she finally came up with the old fashioned term, bathroom commode. But when she wrote that down, she still thought she was being too forward. So she started all over again and rewrote the entire letter and referred to the bathroom commode simply as the BC. Does the campground have its own BC, is what she actually asked. Well, the campground owner, when he got the letter, couldn't quite figure out what the lady was talking about. That BC really stumped him. After worrying about it for several days, he showed the letter to all the other campers that were in the campground, see if they could figure it out. You know, no one seemed to understand that, what BC stood for. Then finally, the campground owner had this brilliant understanding. He said it must stand for the location of the Baptist Church. <laughs> so he sat down and he wrote the following reply. He said, Dear Madam, I regret very much of the delay in answering your letter, but I now take pleasure in informing that the BC is located 18 kilometres north of the campsite. <laughs> and it's capable of seating 250 people at one time. I admit it's... Uh, it's quite a distance away if you're in the habit of going regularly, but no doubt you'll be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along and they make a day of it. They usually arrive early and they stay late. The last time my wife and I went was six months ago and it was crowded. We had to stand up the whole time we were there. It may interest you to know that right now there's a supper plan to raise money to buy more seats. They plan to hold the supper right in the middle of the BC so everyone can watch and talk about this great event. Whoa. I would like to say it pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly. That's great. But it's surely not for lack of desire on my part. <laughs> As we grow older, it seems to be more and more of an effort, particularly in cold weather. When we decide to come down to our campground, perhaps I can go with you the first time and I can sit with you and I can introduce you to all the other folks. This is really a very friendly community that we live in. Now let's start the more communication, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, Dennis, I think we do really love that story. Yeah. yeah, Paul begins his fourth chapter with what looks like poor communication. You know, he he writes these words. He says, well, hang on, let's have a what's there? Mm -hmm. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord. Now, the therefore refers back to what he's written about in chapter 3. There he's talking about running a race, not looking back, but moving forward. He's urging others to run with him. But in the opening verse of chapter 4, he now says, stand firm. 
it sounds confusing as to what she means for us, whether to run the race or whether to stand firm. You know, one is a picture of extreme effort, the other of immobility, inaction. How can we then follow this call to standing and yet running? If we're taking literally at his word, it's confusing. Nevertheless, thinking this through, you have here a marvelous setting out of the paradox of the Christian faith. For life is indeed a very swiftly moving race. We've all discovered that. You know how at every turn there are challenges and there are new demands that are made upon you, and, a, and time itself brings these things into your life so that it is indeed a race that we're running. You know, when we feel exhausted at the end of each day and sometimes at the end of each week. But the secret of running the race successfully, the Apostle tells us, is learning how to stand firm. A friend of mine who's into running these sorts of marathons tells me that he visualises the end of the race, the goal that he's trying to achieve. And he holds that firmly in his brain as he runs the race. It's this vision of crossing the line, of having achieved his goal, which motivates him on. He says, if you think about the pain in your body, you'll stop. The pain defeats you. The pain slows you down. You need to keep visualising the end of the line. And that's what Paul's talking about. He tells us that the secret of running a race and overcoming all the problems is learning to get a grip on the life of Jesus Christ within us. I think we have an excellent illustration of this in these uh, cable cars that run up and down the hills of San Francisco. Have you ever seen those on, on TV or in the movies? Rosemary and I uh, visited San Francisco a few years back and we just loved riding on these noisy trams. You know, you can actually stand on the side of these things, on the running boards. You know, you, you don't have to sign a waiver or anything like that. They must have incredible insurance. But you stand on the side of this thing as it goes up and down these really steep hills. And it's quite scary. You don't know, have to go to theme parks. You know? Now, actually, the cable car itself, interestingly enough, is incapable of moving. It has no motor. It's impossible to be self propelled at the end of the line, there's this area which is a turntable. And the driver gets enough speed up to roll onto the turntable. Then they have to get off the, the uh, uh, guard and uh, the conductor get off. And they push the car around. And then they have to push it off the turntable again. The only way that car moves up and down the hills is to take a firm grip on the cable which runs under the roadway. And that's why they have this guy who's called a grip man. He pulls back on the levers and the levers drop down through the cable car underneath the road and grip hold of the cable. And as, as they grab hold of the cable, the car can then run up the hill. Now, the cable car, with relationship to the cable, never moves. It always remains standing firm. But the cable moves. And as it moves, the car is able to overcome all of the obstacles, even the steepest of hills in San Francisco. I think that's a beautiful picture of what Paul is saying. Look, though we're running the race of life, we're continually confronting the obstacles demands and pressures that come upon us. The answer is not to try to do something, but to get a grip, a firmer grip on the life of Jesus Christ, which is capable of doing it in us. As we do that, we discover we have an adequacy that handles all of the obstacles. He's quite able to overcome all of the problems, whatever life can throw at us. Now, in saying that, I'm aware that it isn't always easy to do that. We sometimes find ourselves stressing over things and unable to break free. <coughs> Stress and anxiety are big killers in our community. The 
According to WorkSafe Victoria, stress is the second most common cause of workplace compensation claims in Australia after manual handling. Isn't that amazing? The second most common cause of workplace compensation claims. The Australian Psychological Society reports that almost three quarters, 73% of Australians reported that stress was having at least some impact with almost one in five reporting that stress is having a strong to very strong impact on their physical health. It seems finances, family, health issues continue to rank as the top causes of strength, as stress for Australians. So Paul's words are really relevant to us in this day and age, aren't they? How do we overcome this terrible disease? which is threatening so many of us. Paul gives three commands or three directions probably to help us to solve these kinds of problems. The first thing he says is that we need to change our perception. We need to change from being negative to being positive. And he commands us, especially as I said to the kids, to rejoice. A joy is to be in the Lord, and it's unchanging. Paul's own circumstances reminded him of the joy available in the Lord, and he wishes that joy for others as well. Paul knows that no situation is beyond the Lord's help. Christians can rejoice in that, if nothing else. Why can we rejoice? As I said to the kids, we can rejoice because the Lord is near. We're not alone. God is with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter where we go. The Lord is with us. Not only does our perception need to change, though, our behaviour also needs to change, says Paul. When we are stressed, we often get short with people. He exhorts us to gentleness. The word for gentleness has a variety of meanings. Gentleness or kindness in relation to others is the central idea, though. The gentle person doesn't insist on his own rights. Rather, they're looking for what's best for all. So we need to be gentle in our approach. Just step back, take a deep breath, and think. And then, here's the third thing. Apart from our perception changing and our behaviour changing, our thinking needs to change. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. This is a negative command, but it also has a positive thrust. Anxiety is a contradiction of the life of faith. It's destructive, it's self-defeating, worry about whether our needs are going to be met. It expresses itself in idolatry of things. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount spoke about anxiety. He says where he stated that the most common causes of anxiety are clothing, food, drink and the future. Even in our contemporary life with its complexities, the same single concerns cause anxiety. So how do we stop that? Well, prayer cures anxiety. And Paul urges us to make our needs known to God. Note, we do this with thanksgiving. That means we thank God in advance for listening and for answering. Paul's answer to anxiety is the peace of God. He says, the peace of God which passes or which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Not maybe God will respond, but a firm response saying that God will, He will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. For this reason, pray for people. Ah, peace for people. Paul now shares perhaps the most powerful instruction in all of Scripture on what to do when we feel trouble. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, 
Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what are we to do about it? Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or you have received or heard from me or seen in me, what are we to do with it? Put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. I just love this passage because it speaks so plainly and clearly of how to handle those things which cause us emotional pain and anxiety. In effect, what Paul is saying is to reorient your thinking. Most of us naturally think negatively. You know that old illustration about you know the glass half full and the glass half empty, which are you. You know, are you a person when you get a half glass of water, think to yourself, well, it's only half full? Or are you a person who says, oh, only half full? Well, at least half a glass can quench my thirst. You know, do we think positively or negatively? Most of us, even though we try not to be, are a glass half full person. You know, we think negatively. We see the negative side first, and we dwell there. Don't you start thinking negatively? It's hard to shift gears and to swim around. You know, it's really hard. Like me, you've probably been down this road before. Some of you many times before. And you're worried about something. For example, how am I going to pay this huge bill I've received? So you worry about it. You know, and that worry causes you to stay awake at night. All day. You're consumed by thoughts about this bill. And even though you know worrying about it won't get you anywhere, worrying about it doesn't pay the bill. It's hard to stop thinking about it until it just exhausts you and you start getting tetchy with others around you. You know, you can't stand people making comments. What are you looking at? It affects every part of you. It's still the bill waits to be paid. What's the better way of handling the situation? How do I put into practice what Paul is saying? Well, if I'm to follow Paul's pattern, the first thing I want to do is rejoice. But you don't have to handle the problem alone. God is with you. So talk with God about the situation. God, I have this bill. And I just don't know where I'm going to get the money to meet it. Show me what I can do about this. Why does that prayer be different to how we usually pray? When we're in such a situation, we'd say, God, I need you to pay this bill for me. <coughs> Why should God pay the bill? You incurred the debt. No. We need to believe is the next thing. Leave your anxiety in the matter with God. Believing that he's going to provide you with an answer. It could be that there are some funds you've forgotten about or an opportunity to earn extra funds to pay the account or maybe a way of negotiating with the person or the company so that you can pay the account as you have the funds. Who knows? God has hundreds of answers. You just need to trust him provide those to us. So believe. Then the next step is crucial. Give thanks for God's answers even before you receive them. The way you do this is to be in mind with the new, positive, healthy thoughts of God. Paul says, fill your mind with whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Whatever you've learned or you've received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. So we fill our minds with the positive things of God and also put these things into practice in our own life. It could be a song that you've heard. Yeah, it could be a piece of music that you love. Put it on in your brain and rejoice in it. It could be passages of scripture that you've heard over a period of time. Recall those to memory. 
or words of encouragement that someone has spoken to you, or remembrances of happy times and situations. We need to fill all those cracks and crevices with positive, happy memories. And then we discover that the God of peace will be with us. It's like that marathon runner that we talked about before. What do we say the marathon runner does? They focus on the future joy of crossing the finishing line, of setting a new personal best time, the joy of greeting family and friends at the end of the race, and they don't feel the pain in their limbs or their aching lungs, sucking every breath. They don't stop running. They keep on running with that vision in their mind. And we need to run with that same vision that God is answering our prayers. And to draw on the other illustration of the cable car, when you hold on tight to the cable, who is Jesus Christ, then we're able to progress through the storms of life. There is no hill, no mountain that can hold us back. You know, I know some of you are probably sitting there saying to yourselves, oh, I've heard this many times, and I've tried it, and it doesn't work. The problems don't go away. I still couldn't sleep at night. You know, I've discovered that the, one of the greatest blockers to us overcoming anxiety and stress is that we give up too soon. We allow those negative thoughts to creep back really quickly. This is something you have to keep working at. Keep flooding your mind with those good and positive thoughts Persevere and you break through. How do I know that? I know it because that's what I and many other good Christian friends do. And we've conquered it. Remember, Paul wasn't sitting in a nice air conditioned office in Rome, sipping Cafe Lato when he wrote this letter. You know, he's under house arrest. He's awaiting the trial which will bring an end to his life on earth. Yet he writes with a calmness. He knows that God is with him and will walk with him through all the circumstances of his life ahead. Do you know that same promise for yourself? Or are you weighed down from carrying the heavy emotional loads? Maybe it's a situation at work or at home or in the family. It could be to do with finances. It could be to do with your health or your personal relationships. It doesn't matter. What matters is that it's weighing you down. And you're just not sleeping at night. You toss and you turn. And you're constantly thinking about it. Perhaps your diet's suffering. You either can't eat or you overeat. It doesn't matter. You just feel burdened and tired of it all. Listen to Jesus. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Are you ready for Jesus to lift the burden off your shoulders? To give you that peace that you want? Peace of God which passes all understanding is available to you. God is going to come in a few minutes and he's going to lead us in a time of prayer. This will be an opportunity for you to find relief from the heavy burden that you're carrying. So today, come and let us pray with you. Don't waste that opportunity to find the peace of God which passes all understanding. Jesus loves you and he wants you to find that peace.